Your lecturer is Dr. David Brackey. Dr. Brackey is the Joe R. Engel Chair in the History of Christianity and Professor of History at The Ohio State University. He received his Master of Divinity degree from Harvard Divinity School and his Doctorate in Religious Studies from Yale University. Professor Brackey has published extensively on the history and literature of ancient Christianity, especially Egyptian Christianity, early monasticism, the formation of the biblical canon, and Gnosticism. His books include The Gnostics, Myth, Ritual, and Diversity in Early Christianity, and Introduction to Christianity with Mary Jo Weaver. Professor Brackey also served as editor of the Journal of Early Christian Studies. One day in 1945, an Egyptian peasant named Muhammad Ali al-Saman went out to dig for fertilizer, and he started a revolution in how we understand the history of religions in the ancient world. Ali was digging in the cliffs across the Nile River from the town of Nag Hammadi. While he was digging, he came upon a large earthenware jar with manuscripts inside. Those manuscripts opened the door to an entire religious world that we once knew only dimly. That world is the religious movements that we call Gnosticism. In this course, we're going to study a set of religious texts, persons, and groups that date mostly to the Roman Empire in the four, first four centuries AD. We'll find that these texts and the people who wrote them are very diverse in their teachings and lifestyles but they all share an interest in knowledge, in Greek, gnosis. And they all suffered rejection and condemnation from what eventually became Orthodox Catholic Christianity. They are all, as the bishops and priests of the church would say, heretics. The movements that scholars have called Gnosticism may have been labeled heretical, but they were profound and compelling attempts to speak to the human condition of evil and suffering. We'll want to understand the messages of hope and salvation that they offered to ancient people. And these movements are important because they exerted a strong influence on the history of Western religions. Orthodox Christianity became what it is in part in response to these teachings of Gnosis. The Gnostics and other religious teachers offered advanced knowledge of religious truth they produced complicated myths to explain God and the origin of this world. And they sought mystic union with the divine. These themes of advanced knowledge, myth-making, and mystical union have persisted, not only in Christianity, but also in Judaism and Islam. To begin, I want to explain what words like gnosis, gnostic, and gnosticism mean and give you a sense of the general features of the religious movements that we call Gnosticism. What were their distinctive ideas? Why did these ideas appeal to ancient people? And why did the teachings of the Gnostics alarm other Christian leaders? I also want to explain the importance of the manuscripts that Muhammad Ali al-Saman found near Nag Hammadi, and why much of what I will discuss in this course we didn't even know just 70 years ago. The English word Gnosticism was invented by an English scholar in the 17th century, but he based it on the Greek word gnosis. As I said, gnosis in ancient Greek means knowledge, but not just any kind of knowledge. It refers to personal, direct, immediate knowledge. For example, if I told you that I know a lot about the city of London, you would expect that I know where it's located, what its history is, how it's laid out, and so on, but you might not think that I have necessarily been to London personally. I could have acquired this knowledge through books, television programs, or websites. But if I were to say to you, I know London, that's something different. In that case, I'm saying that I've been to London. I've walked its streets, talked to its inhabitants, eaten in its restaurants, and so on. This kind of knowledge is immediate, direct, and personal. And it's hard to put into words.
I might say about another person, yes, I know Susan, and I could probably describe Susan and her life in some detail, but I probably would not be able to explain to you fully in words my knowledge of Susan. You really have to get to know Susan yourself if you want to really know Susan. And you really have to go to London yourself if you really want to know London. That's the kind of knowledge Gnosis is. What the ancient Gnostics said is that they have, and they can offer to others, Gnosis of God. Direct, immediate, personal knowledge of God. Now this claim that they have and supply Gnosis of God did not make the Gnostics unique in the ancient world. Many other religious teachers and groups said the same thing, including other Christians who are now considered Orthodox. What set the Gnostics apart was their use of the term Gnostic to describe themselves and the content of the Gnosis or knowledge that they offered. The adjective and noun Gnostic comes from the Greek word Gnostikos, which meant having to do with Gnosis or supplying Gnosis. The great philosopher Plato, who died around 347 BC, invented the adjective gnosticos to describe fields of study and parts of the human intellect that have to do with gnosis. Fields of study that are gnosticos, Plato said, don't give you practical knowledge, knowledge that you can use directly to accomplish things like carpentry or baking. Instead, a gnosticos science provides knowledge that's simply knowledge higher knowledge that may make you wiser or more virtuous, but doesn't really give you a skill. For example, higher forms of mathematics. Later philosophical writers who admired Plato continued to use the term gnosticos, but always to refer to fields of study or to aspects of the human intellect. It was a highly technical word, one that scholars would use, not one that most ordinary people would ever use. But around the year 180 AD, a Christian leader and writer named Irenaeus revealed that certain Christians were using the term Gnosticos to refer to themselves. They were the Gnostics, and they formed a group called the Gnostic School of Thought. This is the first time in history that we know of people being called Gnostic. Clearly, these self-proclaimed Gnostics were highlighting their special relationship to Gnosis. A lot of people and groups claimed to offer Gnosis of God, including Irenaeus, but these folks made Gnosis the defining feature of their religious identity. In the coming lectures, we'll learn a lot more about Irenaeus, who was a leader of Christians in Lyon in France. That's because Irenaeus' writings constitute our earliest and most detailed source for the teachings of the Gnostics and other groups that modern people call Gnosticism. The Gnostics were among the many groups of Christians during Irenaeus' day. But Irenaeus was a fierce critic of the Gnostics and these other groups. According to him, the Gnostics did not offer true Gnosis of God. Rather, their teachings provided Gnosis falsely so-called. That brings us to the second distinctive feature of the Gnostics and the other movements of ancient Gnosticism, the content of the religious knowledge that they offered. We're going to see that the persons and groups that Irenaeus condemned did not teach all the same things, but there are some key ideas that they all had in common. First, they believed that the material universe in which we live is seriously flawed, even a mistake, something that God did not really intend. The Gnostics and others had a profound sense of the imperfection that surrounds us and oppresses us. This is a world of disease, suffering, and death. Rich and powerful people dominate and enslave those who are weaker and more vulnerable. This world simply cannot be our true home. It cannot be where we are meant to live forever. And so, the Gnostics and others concluded, second, that the God who created this universe cannot be the highest ultimate God. Instead, he must be a lower, inferior God, perhaps even a demonic or hostile God. The Gnostics offered Gnosis of the true God, a God who's entirely spiritual and serene and unchanging, a God truly worthy of our devotion and worship, a God that most human beings have not known.
This is an important point of conflict between the Gnostics and other Christians. For the Gnostics claim that the God that you meet in the book of Genesis, the God who created the universe, the God who made Adam and Eve, the God who destroyed the world with the flood and saved Noah, that God is not the real God, but a lower, inferior God. We'll see that this idea was not as different from what other Jews and Christians believed as we might think at first. But the Gnostics and groups like them emphasized the inferiority of the God of the Jewish Bible or the Old Testament to a degree that disturbed their opponents. Third, the movements that we call Gnosticism tend to stress that we have our origin in the spiritual world of the highest God. That is, our true selves are not the bodies that we have, and sometimes not even our souls. These substances come from the lower universe and are not eternal. Instead, our true selves are our intellect, or spirit, which originated in the spiritual realm and will return there. The problem is, is that most of us don't know this. I think that my body and its needs for food, sleep, sex, and so on are what's important. I mistakenly think that this world is my true home. I'm ignorant of my true self, alienated from who I really am. So a big part of the gnosis that Gnostics offered was knowledge of one's own self, an end to my self-alienation. Finally, the movements that we call Gnosticism tended to communicate their ideas in elaborate myths, sacred stories that told who God is, how the universe came to be, what the original human beings were like, and what will happen in the future. These myths, drew upon a variety of religious and philosophical traditions. We'll see that the Jewish Bible, especially Genesis, was the major source for the themes and characters in Gnostic myth. But the Gnostics also looked to the works of Plato, and sometimes even to pagan mythology for their ideas. The myths that we will study usually strike modern readers as strange and complicated. And that's because they are. We'll meet characters that may be familiar to you from the Bible and Christianity, such as Adam and Eve, their son Seth, Noah, Jesus, and even God's wisdom. But we'll also meet divine beings that are unique to Gnostic mythology. Some of these have abstract philosophical names like forethought or the divine self-originate. But others have obscure proper names like Yaldabaoth, Barbelo, and Eleleth. There are even some new human characters, like Norea, the sister of Seth. We'll explore the complexity of the myths told by the Gnostics and others, like the Manichaeans, but we'll try to look behind that complexity to see the appeal of these stories. In fact, I think that the complexity of the myths was part of their appeal. Some of it must have been simply entertaining, just as people today might find a complicated fantasy novel with lots of characters fun to read. But at a deeper level, I think that ancient people might have expected that gnosis of the true God, wisdom that has been hidden for ages, would be difficult and not simple. Mastering a complex myth, understanding its characters and its themes, might have given people a sense of their own intelligence and religious wisdom. I really do know something important, a Gnostic probably thought. Studying the Gnostics and other so-called heretical groups like them is difficult because so few sources survive. This is a general problem with studying anything having to do with the ancient world. Even beloved and important works from major authors have been lost or survive in very few copies because it was up to medieval and Byzantine monks to copy them by hand over centuries. In the case of Gnostic and other so-called heretical works, the problem is more acute. Monks just stopped copying these texts. No one wanted to read them, and sometimes you could get in trouble for for reproducing them. For centuries, then, historians had to rely on the writings of Irenaeus and other opponents of the Gnostics for information about them. We call writers like Irenaeus heresiologists because their works catalog heretical groups and summarize their teachings. Obviously, this is useful information, but it's very problematic. The heresiologists did not want to present an objective or neutral account of these heresies in order to help later historians. 
No, their goal was to expose the false nature of the heretical teachings and to denigrate them as much as possible. Imagine then how excited historians were when during the 19th and 20th centuries, manuscripts of Gnostic works and other heretical writings were discovered. All of these new texts were discovered in Egypt because Egypt's dry climate means that books that are buried or hidden away can survive for centuries. The most spectacular and important of these new findings was the discovery of the Nag Hammadi codices. The Nag Hammadi codices are 13 ancient manuscripts that were discovered in 1945 in Egypt across the Nile River from the town of Nag Hammadi. But what are codices? Well, codices is the plural for codex, and a codex is a type of ancient manuscript. It's formatted like a modern book with individual pages written on the back and front, which are then sewn together and placed inside a cover. The codex was a major innovation in antiquity. Most ancient manuscripts were scrolls. These were long, single sheets of papyrus. A scribe would write on one side of the scroll from the top to the bottom, and then roll and unroll it when he wanted to use it. Although this style of writing was quite ancient, I'm sure you can imagine that it was also impractical and cumbersome. Starting in the 100s AD, however, the early Christians began using the Codex for their manuscripts. Some scholars speculate that early Christians changed to the Codex because codices made it easier for them to quickly find passages in the Bible. In any case, the fact that the Nag Hammadi manuscripts are codices and not scrolls is our first clue that their original owners were probably Christians. So how did the Nag Hammadi codices get into the possession of scholars? Muhammad Ali al-Saman, the peasant who found the codices, could not read them. But Ali believed that they might be worth something. So he brought the books home, and according to the report, his mother actually used some of the pages to start a fire in her oven. Of course, we historians of early Christianity just shudder when we hear that little detail. Ali and his brother wound up getting involved in a violent feud with another family. And so he gave the codices to a local Christian priest for safekeeping. While they were in his possession, the priest showed the manuscripts to a friend who realized that they might be valuable. From here, the priest sent one of the manuscripts to Cairo to be appraised. And with this kind of exposure, antiquities dealers soon became aware of the existence of the codices. Ali and other peasants who got hold of one or more of the manuscripts did get some money for the books, but not much. Eventually, they all ended up in the Coptic Museum in Cairo, where they're still kept today. After the codices were discovered, scholars had to figure out what they were. What language were they written in? What text did they contain? When were these texts composed and by whom? Scholars quickly recognized that the Nag Hammadi codices were written in Coptic which is the last phase of the ancient Egyptian language. Coptic uses the Greek alphabet and a few extra letters to spell Egyptian words. Christians themselves invented written Coptic in the third century so that they could translate the Bible into Egyptian. But while the texts in the Nag Hammadi codices were written in Coptic, they weren't actually composed in Coptic. Like the books of the New Testament, they were all originally written in Greek. Only later were they translated into Coptic. So when we read works from Nag Hammadi in Coptic, we're actually reading ancient Coptic translations of originally Greek texts. But because Coptic had a smaller vocabulary than Greek, sometimes the Coptic translator simply borrowed the Greek word for his translation. And that borrowing helps scholars reconstruct what the Greek wording in the original might have been. We believe that the manuscripts, as we have them, were copied sometime between 350 and 450 AD. Why do we believe this? Well, the persons who made the covers for the codices used scraps of discarded papyrus to make a stiff backing for the leather covers. It turns out that some of these scraps have dates on them, and the latest date is 348 AD.
so we know that the books must have been made sometime after that date. Of course, this doesn't mean that the texts in the codices themselves were originally composed after 348. Because we're dealing with copies of translations, the original Greek texts may have been written much earlier. As we'll see, scholars believe that many of the texts come from the 2nd and 3rd centuries, which would make some of the Greek originals about 200 years older than the translated collection. Now, we don't know who owned these codices or why. Here, the discovery of the Nag Hammadi codices differs greatly from the discovery of the famous Dead Sea Scrolls, a discovery that occurred about the same time. Archaeologists have uncovered evidence for a large community that lived around where the Dead Sea Scrolls were deposited. Archaeological remains and clues in the text themselves have enabled scholars to identify the community that produced the Dead Sea Scrolls as most likely the Jewish sect of the Essenes. In contrast, however, there are no remains of a community where the Nag Hammadi codices were found. There was an ancient Christian monastery not too far away, but there's no indication in the codices that they came from this or any other monastery. So here, scholars can only guess as to who produced and owned the codices. We do know that nicely copied manuscripts with leather covers were expensive. So the owners may have been wealthy, educated individuals. Or they could have been a group, like a monastic community. People sometimes refer to the codices as the Nag Hammadi Library. But we don't know whether they actually did make up a library, that is, an intentional collection owned by a single person or institution. As a matter of fact, as many as 14 different scribes copied these manuscripts, and the texts are written in several different dialects of Coptic. So it's possible that the books originally belonged to several people and were only brought together at a later time, perhaps just before they were buried. We don't know when or why the codices were placed in the jar and buried in the desert sand. Egypt's, Egypt's climate is so dry that manuscripts buried in this way can last for many centuries. As you may know, other Coptic texts appeared before the Nag Hammadi discovery in 1945, and some, of them, uh, some have been discovered since then. The most famous recent discovery of this kind is a codex that contains the Gospel of Judas. But the Nag Hammadi discovery was revolutionary for scholars and historians. Okay, so that's what we know and don't know about the language, dates, and original owners of the Nag Hammadi codices. What about the writings themselves? The contents of the codices are highly diverse, and they provide a good introduction to the different groups and kinds of texts that we'll be looking at in this course. The Nag Hammadi codices contain a total of 52 texts, but some of these are different versions of the same work. So there are actually 46 separate works, or as scholars call them, tractates. These works vary widely in their character. Most of the tractates can be considered Jewish or Christian because they make use of the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible, the New Testament, or other Jewish and Christian literature. Such biblical characters as Adam and Eve or Jesus and the apostles appear in nearly all of them. Other tractates, however, do not come originally from Jews or Christians. For example, there's a fragment of The Republic written by Plato centuries before Christ. Many of the treatises are apocalypses or revelations. These are books in which a divine figure like Jesus or a legendary human being like Adam reveals future events secrets of the cosmos, or spiritual teachings to a chosen person or group. For example, in the Apocalypse or Revelation of Adam, Adam reveals to his son Seth the story of creation and foretells many events in the future. Or in the secret book of James, Jesus appears to his disciples after his resurrection and gives secret teachings to a small group of insiders. The Apocalypse or Revelation is the most frequent type of literature found in the Nag Hammadi codices. But there are also other types of literature, such as theological treatises, sermons, hymns, philosophical letters, and other kinds of writings. 
And several tractates are called Gospels, but none of them resemble the Gospels in the New Testament. The four New Testament Gospels tell the story of Jesus' ministry and emphasize his passion and death. But the Gospel according to Thomas from Nag Hammadi, for instance, presents a collection of Jesus' sayings, somewhat like the biblical book of Proverbs. It does not give any narrative description of Jesus' life or death. In fact, if you had only the Gospel of Thomas, you wouldn't know that Jesus had even been crucified. Likewise, the Gospel of Truth is not a story about Jesus. Rather, it's a sermon about how Jesus brought knowledge of the truth to human beings. So the tractates have different literary forms. They also represent different theological views. All of the works may have appealed to the later collector or collectors in the 4th or 5th century, but they were composed within diverse, even opposed, religious communities as early as the 1st century. Since the Nag Hammadi codices were discovered, edited, and translated, scholars have been working to identify the religious groups and theological perspectives that the works represent. So far, a consensus of scholars has identified four religious groups or traditions represented in the literature from the Nag Hammadi manuscripts. First, we believe that one group is the Gnostics, or Gnostic school of thought, that Irenaeus wrote about in the year 180 AD. Irenaeus described the myth that the Gnostics taught, and it's precisely the same myth that we find in the secret book according to John from Nag Hammadi. This myth is expressed in at least 11 other tractates. Among these works are the Revelation of Adam, the Reality of the Rulers, and the Holy Book of the Great Invisible Spirit. These texts differ in some details, but they all share the same basic myth or sacred story that the Gnostics told. This discovery was exciting because, thanks to Nag Hammadi, we now have texts that come directly from the so-called Gnostic heretics themselves. We'll spend the next seven lectures exploring the myth and rituals of the Gnostic school of thought. But the Gnostics are only one of the groups represented in the Nag Hammadi codices. A second set of works comes from the Valentinian school of Christianity. Once again, it's Irenaeus who fills in the details for us. He says that an influential Christian teacher named Valentinus adapted the Gnostic myth in creating his own system of thought. Valentinus died around the year 175, and in the decades following his death, Christian theologians following and teaching in his tradition formed study groups of interested Christians. This was alongside and sometimes in direct competition with other established Christian churches. We'll explore in some detail the myth and teachings of Valentinian Christians. Valentinian theologians devoted considerable attention to such traditional Christian topics as sin and salvation, the resurrection of the dead, and the sacraments. Valentinian works found at Nag Hammadi include the Treatise on Resurrection and the Gospel According to Philip, among others. Some scholars argue that Valentinus himself is the author of the famous and anonymous Gospel of Truth, and he certainly seems to be an ideal candidate. The Valentinian school of Christianity lasted from the middle of the 2nd century into the 4th century, and it represented an important Christian theological tradition. But after Christianity became the favored religion of the Roman Empire, the Valentinians were condemned as heretics. Valentinus and the Valentinians will be an important part of the course, with four lectures devoted just to them. In addition to the Gnostic school of thought and the Valentinian Christians, a third group of Nag Hammadi writings grants special authority to the apostle Didymus Judas Thomas. Christian tradition credits Thomas with bringing Christianity to Mesopotamia and India, and it sometimes even identifies him as Jesus' twin brother. We see this special authority given to Thomas in the Gospel according to Thomas and the Book of Thomas the Contender. As it turns out, these two works share literary and theological connections with a third work called the Acts of Thomas. This text survives in Greek and Syriac, but it was not found at Nag Hammadi. Taken together, some scholars consider these works evidence for a Thomas Christianity, similar to the community of Christians affiliated with St. Paul. Thomas theology emphasized the divine origin of the soul, its fall from perfection into the body and the material world, 
and how it can return to its origin through the reunion with its true self. We'll devote two lectures to the Gospel according to Thomas. We'll see that although it's often referred to as the most prominent of the Gnostic Gospels, the Gospel of Thomas lacks evidence of the kind of elaborate myth found in the Gnostic works. So scholars are increasingly reluctant to refer to it as being Gnostic. A fourth and final group of writings is perhaps the strangest to our ears. It consists of three tractates from Codex VI, the Discourse on the Eighth and Ninth, the Prayer of Thanksgiving, and an excerpt from The Perfect Discourse, also known as Asclepius. While both the Prayer of Thanksgiving and Asclepius were known before the Nag Hammadi discovery, the Discourse on the Eighth and Ninth is a new addition to the corpus of what scholars call hermetic literature, or hermeticism. These writings belong to a body of ancient literature that centers around the god Hermes, and they may have originated in religious and philosophical circles that were active in Greco-Roman and late ancient Egypt. In these texts, the divine revealer is thrice great Hermes, or Hermes Trismegistus. This mythic figure is a composite of the native Egyptian god Thoth and the Greek god Hermes. Hermeticism is one variety of non-Christian gnosis that we will learn about. Others include Neoplatonism, Manichaeism, and Mandeism. And after we've examined many of these movements, we'll need to ask the most basic question of all. Do they all make up a single thing called Gnosticism? Or is Gnosticism itself just an invention of ancient church leaders and modern scholars? But first, let's learn what we can about the original Gnostics, the first people we know of who developed a myth of Gnosis. In the next lecture, I'll say more about what Irenaeus tells us about the Gnostics, and we'll see how they fit into the great diversity of Christianity in the 2nd and 3rd centuries.